Human Nature and Conduct, an Introduction to Social Psychology, published in 1922 by John Dewey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by William Jones. The book begins with this introduction by John Dewey. Proverb. Give a dog a bad name and hang him. Human nature has been the dog of professional moralists, and consequences accord with this proverb. Men's nature has been regarded with suspicion, with fear, with sour looks, and sometimes with enthusiasm for its possibilities, but only when these were placed in contrast with its actualities. Human nature has appeared to be so evilly disposed that the business of morality was to prune and curb it. It would be thought better of if it could be replaced by something else. It has been supposed that morality would be quite superfluous were it not for the inherent weakness, bordering on depravity, of human nature. Some writers with a more genial conception have attributed the current blackening to theologians who have thought to honor the divine by disparaging the human. Theologians have doubtless taken a gloomier view of man than have pagans and secularists, but this explanation doesn't take us far. For, after all, these theologians are themselves human, and they would have been without influence if the human audience had not somehow responded to them. Morality is largely concerned with controlling human nature. When we are attempting to control anything, we are acutely aware of what resists us. So moralists were led, perhaps, to think of human nature as evil because of its reluctance to yield to control, its rebelliousness under the yoke. But this explanation only raises another question. Why did morality set up rules so foreign to human nature? The ends it insisted upon, the regulations it imposed, were, after all, outgrowths of human nature. Why then was human nature so averse to them? Moreover, rules can be obeyed and ideals realized only as they appeal to something in human nature and awaken in it an active response. So moral principles that exalt themselves by degrading human nature are in effect committing suicide or else they involve human nature in unending civil war and treat it as a hopeless mess of contradictory forces. We are forced, therefore, to consider the nature and origin of that control of human nature with which morals has been occupied. And the fact which is forced upon us when we raise this question is the existence of classes. Control has been vested in an oligarchy. Indifference to regulation has grown in the gap which separates the ruled from the rulers. Parents, priests, chiefs, social censors have supplied aims, aims which were foreign to those upon whom they were imposed, to the young, laymen, and ordinary folk. A few have given and administered rule, and the masses have in a passable fashion and with reluctance obeyed. Everybody knows that good children are those who make as little trouble as possible for their elders. And since most of them cause a good deal of annoyance, they must be naughty by nature. Generally speaking, good people have been those who did what they were told to do. And lack of eager compliance is a sign of something wrong in their nature. But no matter how much men in authority have turned moral rules into an agency of class supremacy, any theory which attributes the origin of rule to deliberate design is false. To take advantage of conditions after they have come into existence is one thing. To create them for the sake of an advantage to accrue is quite another thing. We must go back to the bare fact of social division into superior and inferior. To say that accident produced social conditions is to perceive they were not produced by intelligence. Lack of understanding of human nature is the primary cause of disregard for it. 
lack of insight always ends in despising or else unreasoned admiration. When men had no scientific knowledge of physical nature, they either passively submitted to it or sought to control it magically. What cannot be understood cannot be managed intelligently. It has to be forced into subjection from without. The opaqueness of human nature to reason is equivalent to a belief in its intrinsic irregularity. Hence a decline in the authority of social oligarchy was accompanied by a rise of scientific interest in human nature. This means that the makeup and working of human forces afford a basis for moral ideas and ideals. Our science of human nature in comparison with physical sciences is rudimentary, and morals which are concerned with the health, efficiency, and happiness of a development of human nature are correspondingly elementary. These pages are a discussion of some phases of the ethical change involved in positive respect for human nature when the latter is associated with scientific knowledge. We may anticipate the general nature of this change through considering the evils which have resulted from severing morals from the actualities of human physiology and psychology. There is a pathology of goodness as well as of evil, that is, of that sort of goodness which is nurtured by this separation. The badness of good people, for the most part recorded only in fiction, is the revenge taken by human nature for the injuries heaped upon it in the name of morality. In the first place, morals cut off from the positive roots in human nature is bound to be mainly negative. Practical emphasis falls on avoidance, escape of evil, upon not doing things, observing prohibitions. Negative morals assume as many forms as there are types of temperament subject to it. In its commonest form is the protective coloration of a neutral respectability and insipidity of character. For one man who thanks God that he is not as other men, there are a thousand to offer thanks that they are as other men sufficiently as others are to escape attention. Absence of social blame is the usual mark of goodness, for it shows that evil has been avoided. Blame is most readily averted by being so much like everybody else that one passes unnoticed. Conventional morality is a drab morality, in which the only fatal thing is to be conspicuous. If there be flavor left in it, then some natural traits have somehow escaped being subdued. To be so good as to attract notice is to be priggish, too good for this world. The same psychology that brands the convicted criminal as forever a social outcast makes it the part of a gentleman not to obtrude virtues noticeably upon others. The Puritan is never popular, not even in a society of Puritans. In case of a pinch, the mass prefer to be good fellows rather than to be good men. Polite vice is preferable to eccentricity and ceases to be vice. Morals that professedly neglect human nature end by emphasizing those qualities of human nature that are most commonplace and average. They exaggerate the herd instinct to conformity. Professional guardians of morality who have been exacting with respect to themselves have accepted avoidance of conspicuous evil as enough for the masses. One of the most instructive things in all human history is a system of concessions, tolerances, mitigations, and reprieves which the Catholic Church, with its official supernatural morality, has devised for the multitude. Elevation of the spirit above everything natural is tempered by organized leniency for the frailties of flesh. To uphold an aloof realm of strictly ideal realities is admitted to be possible only for a few. Protestantism, except in its most zealous forms, has accomplished the same result by a sharp separation between religion and morality in which a higher justification by faith disposes at one stroke of daily lapses into the gregarious morals of average conduct. There are always ruder forceful natures which cannot tame themselves to the required level of colorless conformity. To them, conventional morality appears 
as an organized futility. Though they are usually unconscious of their own attitude, since they are heartily in favor of morality for the mass, as making it easier to manage them. Their only standard is success, putting things over, getting things done. Being good is to them practically synonymous with ineffectuality. And accomplishment, achievement, is its own justification. They know by experience that much is forgiven to those who succeed. And they leave goodness to the stupid, to those whom they qualify as boobs. Their gregarious nature finds sufficient outlet in the conspicuous tribute they pay to all established institutions as guardians of ideal interests, and in their denunciation of all who openly defy conventionalized ideals. Or they discover that they are the chosen agents of a higher morality and walk subject to specially ordained laws. Hypocrisy, in the sense of a deliberate covering up of a will to evil by loud-voiced protestations of virtue, is one of the rarest occurrences. But the combination in the same person of an intensely executive nature with a love of popular approval is bound, in the face of conventional morality, to produce what the critical term hypocrisy. Another reaction to the separation of morals from human nature is a romantic glorification of natural impulse as something superior to all moral claims. There are those who lack the persistent force of the executive will to break through conventions and to use them for their own purposes, but who unite sensitiveness with intensity of desire. Fastening upon the conventional element in morality, they hold that all morality is a conventionality hampering to the development of individuality. Although appetites are the commonest things in human nature, the least distinctive or individualized, they identify unrestraint in satisfaction of appetite with free realization of individuality. They treat subjection to passion as a manifestation of freedom in the degree in which it shocks the bourgeois. The urgent need for a transvaluation of morals is caricatured by the notion that an avoidance of the avoidances of conventional morals constitutes positive achievement. While the executive type keeps its eye on actual conditions so as to manipulate them, this school abrogates objective intelligence in behalf of sentiment and withdraws into little coteries of emancipated souls. There are others who take seriously the idea of morals separated from the ordinary actualities of humanity, and who attempt to live up to it. Some become engrossed in spiritual egotism. They are preoccupied with the state of their character, concerned for the purity of their motives and the goodness of their souls. The exaltation of conceit, which sometimes accompanies this absorption, can produce a corrosive inhumanity which exceeds the possibilities of any other known form of selfishness. In other cases, persistent preoccupation with the thought of an ideal realm breeds morbid discontent with surroundings or induces a futile withdrawal into an inner world where all facts are fair to the eye. The needs of actual conditions are neglected or dealt with in a half-hearted way because in the light of the ideal they are so mean and sordid. To speak of evil, to strive seriously for change, shows a low mind. Or, again, the ideal becomes a refuge, an asylum, a way of escape from tiresome responsibilities. In varied ways, men come to live in two worlds, one the actual, the other the ideal. Some are tortured by the sense of their irreconcilability. Others alternate between the two, compensating for the strains of renunciation involved in membership in the ideal realm by pleasurable excursions into the delights of the actual. If we turn from concrete effects upon character to theoretical issues, we single out the discussion regarding freedom of will as typical of the consequences that come from separating morals from human nature. Men are wearied with bootless discussions and anxious to dismiss it as a metaphysical subtlety, but nevertheless it contains within itself the most practical of all moral questions, the nature of freedom and the means of its achieving. The separation of morals from human nature, 
leads to a separation of human nature in its moral aspects from the rest of nature and from ordinary social habits and endeavors which are found in business civic life the run of companionships and recreations these things are thought of at most as places where moral notions need to be applied not as places where moral ideas are to be studied and moral energies generated in short the severance of morals from human nature ends by driving morals inwards from the public open out of doors air and light of day into the obscurities and privacies of an inner life the significance of the traditional discussion of free will is that it reflects precisely a separation of moral activity from nature and the public life of men one has to turn from the moral theories to the general human struggle for political economic and religious liberty for freedom of thought speech assemblage and creed to find significant reality in the conception of freedom of will then one finds himself out of the stiflingly close atmosphere of an inner consciousness and in the open air world the cost of confining moral freedom to an inner region is the almost complete severance of ethics from politics and economics the former is regarded as summed up in edifying exhortations and the latter as connected with the arts of expediency separated from larger issues of good in short there are two schools of social reform one bases itself on the notion of a morality which springs from an inner freedom something mysteriously cooped up within personality it asserts that the only way to change institutions is for men to purify their own hearts and that when this has been accomplished change of institutions will follow of itself the other school denies the existence of any such inner power and in so doing conceives that it has denied all moral freedom that men are made what they are by the forces of the environment that human nature is purely malleable and that till institutions are changed nothing can be done clearly this leaves the outcome as hopeless as does an appeal to inner rectitude and benevolence for it provides no leverage for change of environment it throws us back upon accident usually disguised as a necessary law of history or evolution and trusts to some violent change symbolized by civil war to usher in an abrupt millennium well there is an alternative to being pinned in between these two theories we can recognize that all conduct is interaction between elements of human nature and the environment natural and social then we shall see that progress proceeds in two ways and that freedom is found in that kind of interaction which maintains an environment in which human desire and choice count for something there are in truth forces in man as well as without him while they are infinitely frail in comparison with exterior forces yet they may have the support of a foreseen and contriving intelligence when we look at the problem as one of an adjustment to be intelligently attained the issue shifts from within personality to an engineering issue the establishment of arts of education and social guidance the idea persists that there is something materialistic about natural science and that morals are degraded by having anything seriously to do with material things if a sect should arise proclaiming that men ought to purify their lungs completely before they ever drew a breath it ought to win many adherents from professed moralists for the neglect of sciences that deal specifically with facts of natural and social environment leads to a sidetracking of moral forces into an unreal privacy of an unreal self it is impossible to say how much of the remedial suffering of the world is due to the fact that physical science is looked upon as merely physical it is impossible to say how much of the unnecessary slavery of the world is due to the conception that moral issues can be settled within conscience 
or human sentiment apart from consistent study of facts and applications of specific knowledge in industry, law, and politics. Outside of manufacturing and transportation, science gets its chance in war. These facts perpetuate war and the hardest, most brutal side of modern industry. Each sign of disregard for the moral potentialities of physical science drafts the conscience of mankind away from concern with the interactions of man and nature, which must be mastered if freedom is to be a reality. It diverts intelligence to anxious preoccupation with the unrealities of a purely inner life, or strengthens reliance upon outbursts of sentimental affection. The masses swarm to the occult for assistance. The cultivated smile contemptuously. They might smile, as the saying goes, out of the other side of their mouths if they realized how recourse to the occult exhibits the practical logic of their own beliefs. For both rest upon a separation of moral ideas and feelings from knowledgeable facts of life, man, and the world. It is not pretended that a moral theory based upon realities of human nature and a study of the specific connections of these realities with those of physical science would do away with moral struggle and defeat. It would not make the moral life as simple a matter as winning one's way along a well-lighted boulevard. All action is an invasion of the future, of the unknown. Conflict and uncertainty are the ultimate traits. But morals based upon concern with facts and deriving guidance from knowledge of them would at least locate the points of effective endeavor and would focus available resources upon them. It would put an end to the impossible attempt to live in two unrelated worlds. It would destroy fixed distinction between the human and the physical, as well as that between the moral and the industrial and political. A moral based upon study of human nature instead of upon disregard for it would find the facts of man continuous with those of the rest of nature and would thereby ally ethics and physics and biology. It would find the nature and activities of one person coterminous with those of other human beings and therefore link ethics with the study of history, sociology, law, and economics. Such a morals would not automatically solve moral problems nor resolve perplexities, but it would enable us to state problems in such forms that action could be courageously and intelligently directed to their solution. It would not assure us against failure, but it would render failure a source of instruction. It would not protect us against the future emergence of equally serious moral difficulties but it would enable us to approach the always recurring troubles with a fund of growing knowledge which would add significant values to our conduct even when we overtly failed as we should continue to do until the integrity of morals with human nature and of both with the environment is recognized we shall be deprived of the aid of past experience to cope with the most acute and deep problems of life accurate and extensive knowledge will continue to operate only in dealing with purely technical problems the intelligent acknowledgement of the continuity of nature man and society will alone secure a growth of morals which will be serious without being fanatical aspiring without sentimentality adapted to reality without conventionality sensible without taking the form of calculation of profits, and idealistic without being romantic. End of the Introduction to Human Nature and Conduct by John Dewey Human Nature and Conduct by John Dewey Part 1, Section 1, Habits as Social Functions and Arts, Social Complicity, Subjective Factors. This LibriVox recording, read by William Jones, is in the public domain. Habits may be profitably compared to physiological functions like breathing, digesting. The latter are, 
to be sure involuntary, while habits are acquired. But important as is this difference, for many purposes it should not conceal the fact that habits are like functions in many respects and especially in requiring the cooperation of organism and environment. Breathing is an affair of the air as truly as of the lungs. Digesting an affair of food as truly as of tissues of the stomach. Seeing involves light just as certainly as it does the eye and optic nerve. Walking implicates the ground as well as the legs. Speech demands physical air and human companionship and audience as well as vocal organs. We may shift from the biological to the mathematical use of the word function and say that natural operations like breathing and digesting, acquired ones like speech and honesty, are functions of the surroundings as truly as of the person. They are things done by the environment by means of organic structures or acquired dispositions. The same air that under certain conditions ruffles the pool or wrecks buildings under other conditions purifies the blood and conveys thought. The outcome depends upon what air acts upon. The social environment acts through native impulses and speech and moral habitudes manifest themselves. There are specific good reasons for the usual attribution of acts to the person from whom they immediately proceed. But to convert this special reference into a belief of exclusive ownership is as misleading as to suppose that breathing and digesting are complete within the human body. To get a rational basis for moral discussion, we must begin with recognizing that functions and habits are ways of using and incorporating the environment in which the latter has its say as surely as the former. We may borrow words from a context less technical than that of biology and convey the same idea by saying that habits are arts. They involve skill of sensory and motor organs, cunning or craft, and objective materials. They assimilate objective energies and eventuate in command of environment. They require order, discipline, and manifest technique. They have a beginning, middle, and end. Each stage marks progress in dealing with materials and tools, advance in converting material to active use. We should laugh at anyone who said that he was master of stoneworking and that the art was cooped up within himself and in no wise dependent upon support from objects and assistance from tools. In morals we are, however, quite accustomed to such a fatuity. Moral dispositions are thought of as belonging exclusively to a self. The self is thereby isolated from natural and social surroundings. A whole school of morals flourishes upon capital drawn from restricting morals to character and then separating character from conduct, motives from actual deeds. Recognition of the analogy of moral action with functions and arts uproots the causes which have made morals subjective and individualistic. It brings morals to earth, and if they still aspire to heaven, it is to the heavens of the earth, not to another world. Honesty, chastity, malice, peevishness, courage, triviality, industry, irresponsibility are not private possessions of a person. They are working adaptations of personal capacities with environing forces. All virtues and vices are habits which incorporate objective forces. They are interactions of elements contributed by the makeup of an individual with elements supplied by the outdoor world. They can be studied as objectively as physiological functions, and they can be modified by change of either personal or social elements. If an individual were alone in the world, he would form his habits, assuming the impossible, namely that he would be able to form them in a moral vacuum. They would belong to him alone or to him only in reference to physical forces. Responsibility and virtue would be his alone. But since habits involve the support of environing conditions, a society or some specific group of fellow men is always accessory before and after the fact. Some activity proceeds from men and it sets up reactions in the surroundings. Others approve, 
disapprove, protest, encourage, share and resist. Even letting a man alone is a definite response. Envy, admiration, and imitation are complicities. Neutrality is non-existent. Conduct is always shared. This is the difference between it and a physiological process. It is not an ethical ought that conduct should be social. It is social, whether bad or good. Washing one's hands of the guilt of others is a way of sharing guilt so far as it encourages in others a vicious way of action. Non-resistance to evil, which takes the form of paying no attention to it, is a way of promoting it. The desire of an individual to keep his own conscience stainless by standing aloof from badness may be a sure means of causing evil and thus creating personal responsibility for it. Yet there are circumstances in which passive resistance may be the most effective form of nullification of wrong action, or in which heaping coals of fire on the evildoer may be the most effective way of transforming conduct. To sentimentalize over a criminal, to forgive because of a glow of feeling, is to incur liability for production of criminals. But to suppose that infliction of retributive suffering suffices, without reference to concrete consequences, is to leave untouched old causes of criminality and to create new ones by fostering revenge and brutality. The abstract theory of justice, which demands the vindication of law irrespective of instruction and reform of the wrongdoer, is as much a refusal to recognize responsibility as is the sentimental gush which makes a suffering victim out of a criminal. Courses of action which put the blame exclusively on a person as if his evil will were the sole cause of wrongdoing, and those which condone offense on account of the share of social conditions in producing bad disposition, are equally ways of making an unreal separation of man from his surroundings, mind from the world. Causes for an act always exist, but causes are not excuses. Questions of causation are physical, not moral, except when they concern future consequences. It is as causes of future actions that excuses and accusations alike must be considered. At present, we give way to resentful passion, then rationalize our surrender by calling it a vindication of justice. Our entire tradition regarding punitive justice tends to prevent recognition of social partnership in producing crime. It falls in with a belief in metaphysical free will. By killing an evildoer or shutting him up behind stone walls, we are unable to forget both him and our part in creating him. Society excuses itself by laying the blame on the criminal. He retorts by putting the blame on bad early surroundings, temptations of others, lack of opportunities, and the persecutions of officers of the law. Both are right except in the wholesale character of their recriminations. But the effect on both sides is to throw the whole matter back into antecedent causation, a method which refuses to bring the matter to truly moral judgment. For morals has to do with acts still within our control, acts still to be performed. No amount of guilt on the part of the evildoer absolves us from responsibility for the consequences upon him and others of our way of treating him, or from our continuing responsibility for the conditions under which persons develop perverse habits. We need to discriminate between the physical and the moral question. The former concerns what has happened and how it happened. To consider this question is indispensable to morals. Without an answer to it, we cannot tell what forces are at work, nor how to direct our actions so as to improve conditions. Until we know the conditions which have helped form the characters we approve and disapprove, our efforts to create the one and do away with the other will be blind and halting. But the moral issue concerns the future. It is prospective. To content ourselves with pronouncing judgments of merit and demerit without reference to the fact that our judgments are themselves facts which have consequences and that their value depends upon their consequences is complacently to dodge the moral issue, perhaps even to indulge ourselves in pleasurable passion, just as the person we condemn once indulged himself. The moral problem is that of modifying the factors which now influence future results. To change the working character or will 
of an other, we have to alter objective conditions which enter into his habits. Our own schemes of judgment, of assigning blame and praise, of awarding punishment and honor are part of these conditions. In practical life there are many recognitions of the part played by social factors in generating personal traits. One of them is our habit of making social classifications. We attribute distinctive characteristics to rich and poor, slum dweller and captain of industry, rustic and suburbanite officials, politicians, professors, to members of races, sets, and parties. These judgments are usually too coarse to be of much use, but they show our practical awareness that personal traits are functions of social situations. When we generalize this perception and act upon it intelligently, we are committed by it to recognize that we change character from worse to better only by changing conditions among which, once more, are our own ways of dealing with the one we judge. We cannot change habit directly. That notion is magic, but we can change it indirectly by modifying conditions, by an intelligent selecting and weighing of the objects which engage attention and which influence the fulfillment of desires. A savage can travel after a fashion in the jungle. Civilized activity is too complex to be carried on without smooth roads. It requires signals and junction points, traffic authorities and means of easy and rapid transportation. It demands a congenial, antecedently prepared environment. Without it, civilization would relapse into barbarism in spite of the best of subjective intention and internal good disposition. The eternal dignity of labor and art lies in their effecting that permanent reshaping of environment which is the substantial foundation of future security and progress. Individuals flourish and wither away like grass of the fields, but the fruits of their work endure and make possible the development of further activities having fuller significance. It is of grace and not of ourselves that we lead civilized lives. There is sound sense in the old pagan notion that gratitude is the root of all virtue. Loyalty to whatever in the established environment makes a life of excellence possible is the beginning of all progress. The best we can accomplish for posterity is to transmit unimpaired and with some increment of meaning the environment that makes it possible to maintain the habits of decent and refined life. Our individual habits are links in forming the endless chain of humanity. Their significance depends upon environment inherited from our forerunners, and it is enhanced as we foresee the fruits of our labors in the world which our successors live. For however much has been done, there always remains more to do. We can retain and transmit our own heritage only by constant remaking of our own environment. Piety to the past is not for its own sake, nor for the sake of the past, but for the sake of a present so secure and enriched that it will create a yet better future. Individuals with their exhortations, their preachings and scoldings, their inner aspirations and sentiments have disappeared, but their habits endure, because these habits incorporate objective conditions in themselves. So will it be with our activities. We may desire abolition of war, industrial justice, greater equality of opportunity for all, but no amount of preaching goodwill or of the golden rule or cultivation of sentiments of love and equity will accomplish the results. There must be change in objective arrangements and institutions. We must work on the environment, not merely on the hearts of men. To think otherwise is to suppose that flowers can be raised in a desert or motor cars run in a jungle. Both things can happen and without a miracle, but only by first changing the jungle and desert. Yet the distinctively personal or subjective factors in habit count. Taste for flowers may be the initial step in building reservoirs and irrigation canals. The stimulation of desire and effort is one preliminary to the change of surroundings. While personal exhortation, advice, and instruction is a feeble stimulus compared with that which steadily proceeds from the impersonal forces and depersonalized habitudes of the environment. Yet they may start the latter going. Taste, appreciation, and effort always spring from some accomplished objective situation. They have objective support. They represent the liberation of something formally accomplished so that it is useful in further operation. A genuine appreciation of the beauty of flowers is not generated within a self-enclosed consciousness. 
it reflects a world in which beautiful flowers have already grown and been enjoyed taste and desire represent a prior objective fact recurring in action to secure perpetuation and extension desire for flowers comes after actual enjoyment of flowers but it comes before the work that makes the desert blossom it comes before cultivation of plants every ideal is preceded by an actuality but the ideal is more than a repetition and inner image of the actual it projects in the secure and wider and fuller form some good which has been previously experienced in a precarious accidental fleeting way end of part one section one habits as social functions Human Nature and Conduct by John Dewey, Part 1, Section 2, Habits and Will. Active Means, Ideas of Ends, Means and Ends, Nature of Character. This LibriVox recording, read by William Jones, is in the public domain. It is a significant fact that in order to appreciate the peculiar place of habit in activity, we have to betake ourselves to bad habits. Foolish idling, gambling, addiction to liquor and drugs. When we think of such habits, the union of habit with desire and with propulsive power is forced upon us. When we think of habits in terms of walking, playing a musical instrument, typewriting, we are much given to thinking of habits as technical abilities existing apart from our likings and as lacking in urgent impulsion we think of them as passive tools waiting to be called into action from without a bad habit suggests an inherent tendency to action and also a hold a command over us it makes us do things we are ashamed of things which we tell ourselves we prefer not to do it overrides our formal resolutions our conscious decisions when we are honest with ourselves we acknowledge that a habit has this power because it is so intimately part of ourselves it has a hold upon us because we are the habit our self-love our refusal to face facts combined perhaps with a sense of possible better although unrealized self leads us to eject the habit from the thought of ourselves and conceive it as an evil power which has somehow overcome us we feed our conceit by recalling that the habit was not deliberately formed we never intended to become idlers or gamblers or roues and how can anything be deeply ourselves which developed accidentally without set intention these traits of a bad habit are precisely the things which are most instructive about all habits and about ourselves they teach us that all habits are affections that all have projectile power and that a predisposition formed by a number of specific acts is an immensely more intimate and fundamental part of ourselves than our vague general conscious choices all habits are demands for certain kinds of activity and they constitute the self in any intelligible sense of the word will they are will they form our effective desires and they furnish us with our working capacities they rule our thoughts determining which shall appear and be strong and which shall pass from light into obscurity we may think of habits as means waiting like tools in a box to be used by conscious resolve but they are something more than that they are active means means that project themselves energetic and dominating ways of acting we need to distinguish between materials tools and means proper nails and boards are not strictly speaking means of a box they are only materials for making it even the saw and hammer are means only when they are employed in some actual making. Otherwise, they are tools or potential means. They are actual means only when brought in conjunction with eye, arm, and hand in some specific operation. And eye, arm, and hand are, correspondingly, means proper only when they are in active operation, 
And whenever they are in action they are cooperating with external materials and energies. Without support from beyond themselves, the eye stares blankly and the hand moves fumblingly. They are means only when they enter into organization with things which independently accomplish definite results. These organizations are habits. This fact cuts two ways. Except in a contingent sense, with an if, neither external materials nor bodily and mental organs are in themselves means. They have to be employed in coordinated conjunction with one another to be actual means or habits. This statement may seem like the formulation in technical language of a commonplace. But belief in magic has played a large part in human history, and the essence of all hocus-pocus is the supposition that results can be accomplished without the joint adaptation to each other of human powers and physical conditions. A desire for rain may induce men to wave willow branches and to sprinkle water. The reaction is natural and innocent. But then men go on to believe that their act has immediate power to bring rain without the cooperation of intermediate conditions of nature. This is magic. While it may be natural or spontaneous, it is not innocent. It obstructs intelligent study of operative conditions and wastes human desire and effort in futilities. Belief in magic did not cease when the coarser forms of superstitious practice ceased. The principle of magic is found whenever it is hoped to get results without intelligent control of means, and also when it is supposed that means can exist and yet remain inert and inoperative. In morals and politics, such expectations still prevail, and in so far, the most important phases of human actions are still affected by magic. We think that by feeling strongly enough about something, by wishing hard enough, we can get a desirable result, such as virtuous execution of a good resolve, or peace among nations, or goodwill in industry. We slur over the necessity of the cooperative action of objective conditions, and the fact that this cooperation is assured only by persistent and close study. Or, on the other hand, we fancy we can get these results by external machinery, by tools or potential means, without a corresponding functioning of human desires and capacities. Oftentimes, these two false and contradictory beliefs are combined in the same person. The man who feels that his virtues are his own personal accomplishments is likely to be also the one who thinks that by passing laws he can throw the fear of God into others and make them virtuous by edict and prohibitory mandate. Recently a friend remarked to me that there is one superstition current among even cultivated persons. They suppose that if one is told what to do, if the right end is pointed to them, all that is required in order to bring about the right act is will or wish on the part of the one who is to act. He used as an illustration the matter of physical posture. The assumption is that if a man is told to stand up straight, all that is further needed is wish and effort on his part, and the deed is done. He pointed out that this belief is on a par with primitive magic in its neglect of attention to the means which are involved in reaching an end. And he went on to say that the prevalence of this belief, starting with false notions about the control of the body and extending to control of mind and character, is the greatest bar to intelligent social progress. It bars the way because it makes us neglect intelligent inquiry to discover the means which will produce a desired result and intelligent invention to procure the means. In short, it leaves out the importance of intelligently controlled habit. We may cite his illustration of the real nature of physical aim or order and its execution in its contrast with the current false notion. A man who has had a bad habitual posture tells himself, or is told, to stand up straight. If he is interested and responds, he braces himself goes through certain movements, and it 
is assumed that the desired result is substantially obtained and that the position is retained at least as long as the man keeps the idea or order in his mind. Consider the assumptions which are here made. It is implied that the means or effective conditions of the realization of a purpose exist independently of established habit, and even that they may be set in motion in opposition to habit. It is assumed that means are there so that the failure to stand erect is wholly a matter of failure of purpose and desire. It needs paralysis or a broken leg or some other equally gross phenomenon to make us appreciate the importance of objective conditions. Now, in fact, a man who can stand properly does so, and only a man who can does. In the former case, fiats of will are unnecessary, and in the latter, useless. A man who does not stand properly forms a habit of standing improperly, a positive, forceful habit. The common implication that his mistake is merely negative, that he is simply failing to do the right thing, and that the failure can be made good by an order of will, is absurd. One might well suppose that the man who is a slave of whiskey drinking is merely one who fails to drink water. Conditions have been formed for producing a bad result, and the bad result will occur as long as those conditions exist. They can no more be dismissed by a direct effort of will than the conditions which create drought can be dispelled by whistling for wind. It is as reasonable to expect a fire to go out when it is ordered to stop burning as to suppose that a man can stand straight in consequence of a direct action of thought and desire. The fire can be put out only by changing the objective conditions. It is the same with the rectification of bad posture. Of course, something happens when a man acts upon his idea of standing straight. For a little while he stands differently, but only a different kind of badly. He then takes the unaccustomed feeling which accompanies his unusual stand as evidence that he is now standing right. But there are many ways of standing badly, and he has simply shifted his usual way to a compensatory bad way at some opposite extreme. When we realize this fact, we are likely to suppose that it exists because control of the body is physical and hence is external to mind and will. Transfer the command inside character and mind, and it is fancied that an idea of an end and the desire to realize it will take immediate effect. After we get to the point of recognizing that habits must intervene between wish and execution, in the case of bodily acts, we still cherish the illusions that they can be dispensed with in the case of mental and moral acts. Thus the net result is to make us sharpen the distinction between non-moral and moral activities and lead us to confine the latter strictly within a private, immaterial realm. But in fact, formation of ideas as well as their execution depends upon habit. If we could form a correct idea without a correct habit, then possibly we could carry it out irrespective of habit. But a wish gets definite form only in connection with an idea, and an idea gets shape and consistency only when it has a habit back of it. Only when a man can already perform an act of standing straight does he know what it is like to have a right posture, and only then can he summon the idea required for proper execution. The act must come before the thought, and he have it before an ability to evoke the thought at will. Ordinary psychology reverses the actual state of affairs. Ideas, thoughts of ends, are not spontaneously generated. There is no immaculate conception of meanings or purposes. Reason pure of all influence from prior habit is a fiction. But pure sensations out of which ideas can be framed apart from habit, are equally fictitious. The sensations and ideas which are the stuff of thought and purpose are alike affected by habits manifested in the acts which give rise to sensations and meanings. The independence of thought 
or the more intellectual factor in our conceptions, upon prior experience is usually admitted. But those who attack the notion of thought pure from the influence of experience usually identify experience with sensations impressed upon an empty mind. They therefore replace the theory of unmixed thoughts with that of pure unmixed sensations as the stuff of all conceptions, purposes, and beliefs. But distinct and independent sensory qualities, far from being original elements, are the products of a highly skilled analysis which disposes of immense technical scientific resources. To be able to single out a definitive sensory element in any field is evidence of a high degree of previous training, that is, of well-formed habits. A moderate amount of observation of a child will suffice to reveal that even such gross discriminations as black, white, red, green are the result of some years of active dealings with things in the course of which habits have been set up. It is not such a simple matter to have a clear-cut sensation. The matter is a sign of training, skill, and habit. Admission that the idea of, say, standing erect is dependent upon sensory materials is, therefore, equivalent to recognition that it is dependent upon the habitual attitudes which govern concrete sensory materials. The medium of habit filters all the material that reaches our perception and thought. The filter is not, however, chemically pure. It is a reagent which adds new qualities and rearranges what it received. Our ideas truly depend upon experience, but so do our sensations. And the experience upon which they both depend is the operation of habits, originally of instincts. Thus our purposes and commands regarding action, whether physical or moral, come to us through the refracting medium of bodily and moral habits. Inability to think aright is sufficiently striking to have caught the attention of moralists. But a false psychology has led them to interpret it as due to a necessary conflict of flesh and spirit, not as an indication that our ideas are as dependent, to say the least, upon our habits as our acts upon our conscious thoughts and purposes. Only the man who can maintain a correct posture has the stuff out of which to form that idea of standing erect, which can be the starting point of a right act. Only the man whose habits are already good can know what the good is. Immediate, seemingly instinctive feeling of the direction and end of various lines of behavior is in reality the feelings of habits working below direct consciousness. The psychology of illusions of perception is full of illustrations of the distortion introduced by habits into observations of objects. The same fact accounts for the intuitive element in judgments of action, an element which is valuable, or the reverse in accord with the quality of dominant habits. For, as Aristotle remarked, the untutored moral perceptions of a good man are usually trustworthy. Those of a bad character, not. But he should have added that the influence of social custom as well as personal habit has to be taken into account in estimating who is the good man and the good judge. What is true of the independence of execution of an idea upon habit is true, then, of the formation and quality of the idea. Suppose that by a happy chance a right concrete idea or purpose, concrete not simply correct in words, has been hit upon. What happens when one with an incorrect habit tries to act in accord with it? Clearly, the idea can be carried into execution only with a mechanism already there. If this is defective or perverted, the best intention in the world will yield bad results. In the case of no other engine does one suppose that a defective machine will turn out good goods simply because it is invited to. Everywhere else we recognize that the design and structure of the agency employed tell directly upon the work done. Given a bad habit and the will or mental direction to get a good result, and the actual happening is a reverse or looking-glass manifestation of the usual fault, a compensatory twist in the opposite direction. Refusal to recognize this fact only leads to a separation of mind from body. 
and to supposing that mental or psychical mechanisms are different in kind from those of bodily operations and independent of them. So deep-seated is this notion that even so scientific a theory as modern psychoanalysis thinks that mental habits can be straightened out by some kind of purely psychical manipulation without reference to the distortions of sensation and perception which are due to bad bodily sets. The other side of the air is found in the notion of scientific nerve psychologists that it is only necessary to locate a particular diseased cell or local lesion independent of the whole complex of organic habits in order to rectify conduct. Means or means, they are intermediate, middle terms. To grasp this fact is to have done with the ordinary dualism of means and ends. The end is merely a series of acts viewed at a remote stage, and a means is merely the series viewed at an earlier one. The distinction of means and end arises in the surveying of the course of a proposed line of action, a connected series in time. The end is the last act thought of. The means are the acts to be performed prior to it in time. To reach an end, we must take our mind off from it and attend to the act which is next to be performed. We must make that the end. The only exception to this statement is in cases where customary habit determines the course of the series. Then all that is wanted is a cue to set it off. But when the proposed end involves any deviation from usual action or any rectification of it, as in the case of standing straight, then the main thing is to find some act which is different from the usual one. The discovery and performance of this unaccustomed act is the end to which we must devote all attention. Otherwise, we shall simply do the old thing over again, no matter what is our conscious command. The only way of accomplishing this discovery is through a flank movement. We must stop even thinking of standing up straight. To think of it is fatal, for it commits us to the operation of an established habit of standing wrong. We must find an act within our power which is disconnected from any thought about standing. We must start to do another thing which on one side inhibits our falling into the customary bad possession and on the other side is the beginning of a series of acts which may lead to the correct posture. Note, the technique of this process is stated in the book of Mr. Alexander, already referred to, and the theoretical statement given is borrowed from Mr. Alexander's analysis. End of note. The hard drinker who keeps thinking of not drinking is doing what he can to initiate the acts which lead to drinking. He is starting with the stimulus to his habit. To succeed, he must find some positive interest or line of action which will inhibit the drinking series, and which, by instituting another course of action, will bring him to his desired end. In short, the man's true aim is to discover some course of action having nothing to do with the habit of drink or standing erect, which will take him to where he wants to go. The discovery of this other series is at once his means and his end. Until one takes intermediate acts seriously enough to treat them as ends, one wastes one's time in any effort at change of habits. Of the intermediate acts, the most important is the next one. The first or earliest means is the most important end to discover. Means and ends are two names for the same reality. The terms denote not a division in reality, but a distinction in judgment. Without understanding this fact, we cannot understand the nature of habits, nor can we pass beyond the usual separation of the moral and non-moral in conduct. End is a name for a series of acts taken collectively, like the term army. Means is a name for the same series taken distributively, like this soldier, that officer. To think of the end signifies to extend and enlarge our view of the act to be performed. It means to look at the next act 
in perspective, not permitting it to occupy the entire field of vision. To bear the end in mind signifies that we should not stop thinking about our next act until we form some reasonably clear idea of the course of action to which it commits us. To attain a remote end means, on the other hand, to treat the end as a series of means. To say that an end is remote or distant, to say, in fact, that it is an end at all, is equivalent to saying that obstacles intervene between us and it. If, however, it remains a distant end, it becomes a mere end, that is, a dream. As soon as we have projected it, we must begin to work backward in thought. We must change what is to be done into a how, the means whereby. The end thus reappears as a series of what-nexts, and the what-next of chief importance is the one nearest the present state of the one acting. Only as the end is converted into means is it definitively conceived or intellectually defined to say nothing of being executable. Just as end, it is vague, cloudy, impressionistic. We do not know what we are really after until a course of action is mentally worked out. Aladdin with his lamp could dispense with translating ends into means, but no one else can do so. Now the thing which is closest to us, the means within our power, is a habit. Some habit impeded by circumstances is the source of the projection of the end. It is also the primary means in its realization. The habit is propulsive and moves any way toward some end or result, whether it is projected as an end in view or not. The man who can walk does walk. The man who can talk does converse, if only within himself. How is this statement to be reconciled with the fact that we are not always walking and talking, that our habits seem so often to be latent and inoperative? Such inactivity holds only of overt, visibly obvious operation. In actuality, each habit operates all the time of waking life. Though like a member of a crew taking his turn at the wheel, its operation becomes the dominantly characteristic trait of an act only occasionally or rarely. The habit of walking is expressed in what a man sees when he keeps still, even in his dreams. The recognition of distances and directions of things from his place at rest is the obvious proof of this statement. The habit of locomotion is latent in the sense that it is covered up counteracted by a habit of seeing which is definitely at the fore. But counteraction is not suppression. Locomotion is a potential energy, not in any metaphysical sense, but the physical sense in which potential energy, as well as kinetic, has to be taken account of in any scientific description. Everything that a man who has a habit of locomotion does and thinks he does and thinks differently on that account. This fact is recognized in current psychology, but is falsified into an association of sensations. Were it not for the continued operation of all habits in every act, no such thing as character could exist. There would be simply a bundle, an untied bundle at that, of isolated acts. Character is the interpenetration of habits. If each habit existed in an insulated compartment and operated without affecting or being affected by others, character would not exist. That is, conduct would lack unity, being only a juxtaposition of disconnected reactions to separated situations. But since environments overlap, since situations are continuous and those remote from one another contain like elements, a continuous modification of habits by one another is constantly going on. A man may give himself away in a look or gesture. Character can be read through the medium of individual acts. Of course, interpenetration is never total. It is most marked in what we call strong characters. Integration is an achievement rather than a datum. A weak, unstable, vacillating character 
is one in which different habits alternate with one another rather than embody one another. The strength, solidity of a habit is not its own possessions, but is due to reinforcement by the force of other habits which it absorbs into itself. Routine specialization always works against interpenetration. Men with pigeonhole minds are not infrequent. Their diverse standards and methods of judgment for scientific, religious, political matters testify to isolated compartmental habits of action. Character that is unable to undergo successfully the strain of thought and effort required to bring competing tendencies into a unity builds up barriers between different systems of likes and dislikes. The emotional stress incident to conflict is avoided not by readjustment but by effort at confinement. Yet the exception proves a rule. Such persons are successful in keeping different ways of reacting apart from one another in consciousness rather than in action. Their character is marked by stigmata resulting from this division. The mutual modification of habits by one another enables us to define the nature of the moral situation. It is not necessary nor advisable to be always considering the interaction of habits with one another, that is to say the effect of a particular habit upon character, which is a name for the total interaction. Such consideration distracts attention from the problem of building up an effective habit. Man who is learning French or chess playing or engineering has his hands full with his particular occupation. He would be confused and hampered by constant inquiry into its effect upon character. He would resemble the centipede who by trying to think of the movement of each leg in relation to all the others was rendered unable to travel. At any given time certain habits must be taken for granted as a matter of course. Their operation is not a matter of moral judgment. They are treated as technical, recreational, professional, hygienic, or economic, or aesthetic, rather than moral. To lug in morals, or ulterior effect on character at every point, is to cultivate moral valetudinarianism or priggish posing. Nevertheless, any act, even that one which passes ordinarily as trivial, may entail such consequences for habit and character as upon occasion to require judgment from the standpoint of the whole body of conduct. It then comes under moral scrutiny. To know when to leave acts without distinctive moral judgment and when to subject them to it is itself a large factor in morality. The serious matter is that this relative pragmatic or intellectual distinction between the moral and non-moral has been solidified into a fixed and absolute distinction so that some acts are popularly regarded as forever within and others forever without the moral domain. From this fatal error, recognition of the relations of one habit to others preserves us, for it makes us see that character is the name given to the working interaction of habits and that the cumulative effect of insensible modifications worked by a particular habit in the body of preferences may at any moment require attention. The word habit may seem twisted somewhat from its customary use when employed as we have been using it. But we need a word to express that kind of human activity which is influenced by prior activity and in that sense acquired which contains within itself a certain ordering or systemization of minor elements of action, which is projective, dynamic in quality, ready for overt manifestation, and which is operative in some subdued, subordinate form, even when not obviously dominating activity. Habit, even in its ordinary usage, comes nearer to denoting these facts than any other word. If the facts are recognized, we may also use the words attitude and disposition. But unless we have first made clear to ourselves the facts which have been set forth under the name of habit, these words are more likely to be misleading than is the word habit. For the latter conveys explicitly the sense of operativeness and actuality. Attitude and, as ordinarily used, disposition suggest something latent, potential, 
something which requires a positive stimulus outside themselves to become active. If we perceive that they denote positive forms of action, which are released merely through removal of some counteracting inhibitory tendency, and then become overt, we may employ them instead of the word habit to denote subdued, non-patent forms of the latter. In this case, we must bear in mind that the word disposition means predisposition, readiness to act overtly in a specific fashion whenever opportunity is presented, this opportunity consisting in removal of the pressure due to the dominance of some overt habit, and that attitude means some special case of a predisposition, the disposition waiting, as it were, to spring through an opened door. While it is admitted that the word habit has been used in somewhat broader sense than is usual, we must protest against the tendency in psychological literature to limit its meaning to repetition. This usage is much less in accord with popular usage than is the wider way in which we have used the word. It assumes from the start the identity of habit with routine. Repetition is in no sense the essence of habit. Tendency to repeat acts is an incident of many habits, but not all. A man with the habit of giving way to anger may show this habit by a murderous attack upon someone who has offended. His act is nonetheless due to habit because it occurs only once in his life. The essence of habit is an acquired disposition to ways or modes of response, not to particular acts except as, under special conditions, these express a way of behaving. Habit means special sensitiveness or accessibility to certain classes of stimuli, standing predilections and aversions, rather than bare recurrence of specific acts. It means will. End of Human Nature and Conduct, Part 1, Section 2. Human Nature and Conduct by John Dewey Part 1, Section 3 Character and Conduct Goodwill and Consequences Virtues and Natural Goods Objective and Subjective Morals This LibriVox recording, read by William Jones, is in the public domain. The Dynamic Force of Habit Taken in connection with the continuity of habits with one another Explains the unity of character and conduct or speaking more concretely, of motive and act, or will and deed. Moral theories have frequently separated these things from each other. One type of theory, for example, has asserted that only will, disposition, and motive counts morally, that acts are external, physical, accidental, that moral good is different from goodness in act since the latter is measured by consequences while moral good or virtue is intrinsic complete in itself a jewel shining by its own light a somewhat dangerous metaphor however the other type of theory has asserted that such a view is equivalent to saying that all that is necessary to be virtuous is to cultivate states of feeling that a premium is put on disregard of the actual consequences of conduct, and agents are deprived of any objective criterion for the rightness and wrongness of acts, being thrown back on their own whims, prejudices, and private peculiarities. Like most opposite extremes in philosophic theories, the two theories suffer from a common mistake. Both of them ignore the projective force of habit and the implication of habits in one another. Hence they separate a unified deed into two disjoined parts, an inner, called motive, and an outer, called act. The doctrine that the chief good of man is goodwill easily wins acceptance from honest men. For common sense employs a juster psychology than either of the theories just mentioned. By will... Common sense understands something practical and moving. It understands the body of habits, of active dispositions, which makes a man do what he does. Will is thus not something opposed to consequences or severed from them. 
It is a cause of the consequences. It is causation in its personal aspect, the aspect immediately preceding action. It hardly seems conceivable to practical sense that by will is meant something which can be complete without reference to deeds prompted and results occasioned. Even the sophisticated specialist cannot prevent relapses from such an absurdity back into common sense. Kant, who went the limit in excluding consequences from moral value, was sane enough to maintain that a society of men of good will would be a society in which fact would maintain social peace, freedom, and cooperation. We take the will for the deed not as substitute for doing or form of doing nothing, but in the sense that other things being equal, the right disposition will produce the right deed. For a disposition means a tendency to act, a potential energy needing only opportunity to become kinetic and overt. Apart from such tendency, a virtuous disposition is either hypocrisy or self-deceit. Common sense, in short, never loses sight wholly of the two facts which limit and define a moral situation. One is that consequences fix the moral quality of an act. The other is that upon the whole, or in the long run, but not unqualifiedly, consequences are what they are because of the nature of desire and disposition. Hence, there is a natural contempt for the morality of the good man who does not show his goodness in the results of his habitual acts. But there is also an aversion to attributing omnipotence to even the best of good dispositions, and hence an aversion to applying the criterion of consequences unreservedly. A holiness of character which is celebrated only on holy days is unreal. A virtue of honesty or chastity or benevolence, which lives upon itself apart from definite results, consumes itself and goes up in smoke. The separation of motive from motive force in action accounts both for the morbidities and futilities of the professionally good and for the more or less subconscious contempt for morality entertained by men of strong executive habit with their preference for getting things done. Yet there is justification for the common assumption that deeds cannot be judged properly without taking their animating dispositions as well as their concrete consequences into account. The reason, however, lies not in isolation of disposition from consequences, but in the need for viewing consequences broadly. This act is only one of a multitude of acts. If we confine ourselves to the consequences of this one act, we shall come out with a poor reckoning. Disposition is habitual and persistent. It shows itself, therefore, in many acts and in many consequences. Only as we keep a running account can we judge disposition, disentangling its tendency from accidental accompaniments. When we once have got a fair idea of its tendency, we are able to place the particular consequences of a single act in a wider context of continuing consequences. Thus we protect ourselves from taking as trivial a habit which is serious and from exaggerating into momentousness an act which viewed in the light of aggregate consequences, is innocent. There is no need to abandon common sense which tells us in judging acts first to inquire into disposition, but there is great need that the estimate of disposition be enlightened by a scientific psychology. Our legal procedure, for example, wobbles between a too tender treatment of criminality and a viciously drastic treatment of it. The vacillation can be remedied only as we can analyze and act in the light of habits, and analyze habits in the light of education, environment, and prior acts. The dawn of truly scientific criminal law will come when each individual case is approached with something corresponding to the complete clinical record which every competent physician attempts to procure as a matter of course in dealing with his subjects. Consequences include effects upon character, upon confirming and weakening habits, as well as tangibly obvious results. To keep an eye open to these effects upon character may signify the most reasonable of precautions 
or one of the most nauseating of practices. It may mean concentration of attention upon personal rectitude in neglect of objective consequences, a practice which creates a wholly unreal rectitude. But it may mean that the survey of objective consequences is duly extended in time. An act of gambling may be judged, for example, by its immediate overt effects, consumption of time, energy, disturbance of ordinary monetary considerations, etc. It may also be judged by its consequences upon character, setting up an enduring love of excitement, a persistent temper of speculation, and a persistent disregard of sober, steady work. To take the latter effects into account is equivalent to taking a broad view of future consequences. For these dispositions affect future companionships, vocation, and avocations, the whole tenor of domestic and public life. For similar reasons, while common sense does not run into that sharp opposition of virtues or moral goods in natural goods, which has played such a large part in professed moralities, it does not insist upon the exact identity of the two. Virtues are ends because they are such important means. To be honest, courageous, kindly, is to be in the way of producing specific natural goods or satisfactory fulfillments. Error comes into theories when the moral goods are separated from their consequences and also when the attempt is made to secure an exhaustive and unerring identification of the two. There is a reason, valid as far as it goes, for distinguishing virtue as a moral good, resident in character alone, from objective consequences. As a matter of fact, a desirable trait of character does not always produce desirable results while good things often happen with no assistance from goodwill. Luck, accident, contingency plays its part. The act of a good character is deflected in operation while a monomaniacal egotism may employ a desire for glory and power to perform acts which satisfy crying social needs. Reflection shows that we must supplement the conviction of the moral connection between character or habit and consequences by two considerations. One is the fact that we are inclined to take the notions of goodness in character and goodness in results in too fixed a way. Persistent disparity between virtuous disposition and actual outcome shows that we have misjudged either the nature of virtue or of success. Judgments of both motive and consequences are still, in the absence of methods of scientific analysis and continuous registration and reporting, rudimentary and conventional. We are inclined to wholesale judgments of character, dividing men into goats and sheep instead of recognizing that all character is speckled and that the problem of moral judgment is one of discriminating the complex of acts and habits into tendencies which are to be specifically cultivated and condemned. We need to study consequences more thoroughly and keep track of them more continuously before we shall be in a position where we can pass with reasonable assurance upon the good and evil in either disposition or results. But even when proper allowances are made, we are forcing the pace when we assume that there is, or ever can be, an exact equation of disposition and outcome. We have to admit the role of accident. We cannot get beyond tendencies and must perforce content ourselves with judgments of tendency. The honest man, we are told, acts upon principle and not from considerations of expediency, that is, of particular consequences. The truth in this saying is that it is not safe to judge the worth of a proposed act by its probable consequences in an isolated case. The word principle is a eulogistic cover for the fact of tendency. The word tendency is an attempt to combine two facts. One, that habits have a certain causal efficacy. The other, that their outworking in any particular case is subject to contingencies, to circumstances which are unforeseeable and which carry an act one side of its usual effect. In cases of doubt, there is no recourse save to stick to tendency, that is, to the probable effect of a habit in the long run, or, as we say, upon the whole. Otherwise, 
we are on the lookout for exceptions which favor our immediate desire. The trouble is that we are not content with modest probabilities. So when we find that a good disposition may work out badly, we say, as Kant did, that the working out, the consequence, has nothing to do with the moral quality of an act, or we strain for the impossible and aim at some infallible calculus of consequences by which to measure moral worth in each specific case. Human conceit has played a great part. It has demanded that the whole universe be judged from the standpoint of desire and disposition, or at least from that of the desire and disposition of the good man. The effect of religion has been to cherish this conceit by making men think that the universe invariably conspires to support the good and bring the evil to naught. By a subtle logic, the effect has been to render morals unreal and transcendental. For, since the world of actual experience does not guarantee this identity of character and outcome, it is inferred that there must be some ulterior, truer reality which enforces an equation that is violated in this life. Hence the common notion of another world in which vice and virtue of character produce their exact moral meed. The idea is equally found as an actuating force in Plato. Moral realities must be supreme, yet they are flagrantly contradicted in a world where Socrates drinks the hemlock of the criminal and where the vicious occupy seats of the mighty. Hence there must be a truer ultimate reality in which justice is only an absolutely justice. Something of the same idea lurks behind every aspiration for realization of abstract justice or equality or liberty. It is the source of all idealistic utopias and also of all wholesale pessimism and distrust of life. Utilitarianism illustrates another way of mistreating the situation. Tendency is not good enough for the utilitarians. They want a mathematical equation of act and consequence. Hence they make light of the steady and controllable factor, the factor of disposition, and fasten upon just the things which are most subject to incalculable accident, pleasures and pains, and embark upon the hopeless enterprise of judging an act apart from character on the basis of definite results. An honestly modest theory will stick to the probabilities of tendency and not import mathematics into morals. It will be alive and sensitive to consequences as they actually present themselves because it knows that they give the only instruction we can procure as to the meaning of habit and disposition. But it will never assume that a moral judgment which reaches certainty is possible. We have just to do the best we can with habits, the forces most under our control, and we shall have our hands more than full in spelling out their general tendencies without attempting an exact judgment upon each deed. For every habit incorporates within itself some part of the objective environment, and no habit and no amount of habits can incorporate the entire environment within itself or themselves. There will always be disparity between them and the results actually attained. Hence, the work of intelligence in observing consequences and in revising and readjusting habits, even the best of good habits, can never be foregone. Consequences reveal unexpected potentialities in our habits whenever these habits are exercised in a different environment from that in which they were formed. The assumption of a stably uniform environment, even the hankering for one, expresses a fiction due to attachment to old habits. The utilitarian theory of equation of acts with consequences is as much a fiction of self-conceit as is the assumption of a fixed transcendental world wherein moral ideals are eternally and immutably real. Both of them deny, in effect, the relevancy of time, of change, to morals, while time is of the essence of the moral struggle. We thus come by an unexpected path upon the old question of the objectivity or subjectivity of morals. Primarily they are objective. For will, as we have seen, means in the concrete habits, and habits incorporate an environment within themselves. They are adjustments of the environment, 
not merely to it. At the same time, the environment is many, not one. Hence will, disposition, is plural. Diversity does not of itself imply conflict, but it implies the possibility of conflict, and this possibility is realized in fact. Life, for example, involves the habit of eating, which in turn involves the unification of organism and nature. But nevertheless, this habit comes into conflict with other habits, which are also objective or in equilibrium with their environments. Because the environment is not all of one piece, man's house is divided within itself against itself. Honor or consideration for others or courtesy conflict with hunger. Then the notion of the complete objectivity of morals gets a shock. Those who wish to maintain the idea unimpaired take the road which leads to transcendentalism. The empirical world, they say, is indeed divided and hence any natural morality must be in conflict with itself this self-contradiction however only points to a higher fixed reality with which a true and superior morality is alone concerned objectivity is saved but at the expense of connection with human affairs our problem is to see what objectivity signifies upon a naturalistic basis how morals are objective and yet secular and social, then we may be able to decide in what crisis of experience morals become legitimately dependent upon character or self, that is, subjective. Prior discussion points the way to the answer. A hungry man could not conceive food as a good unless he had actually experienced, with the support of environing conditions, food as good. The objective satisfaction comes first, but he finds himself in a situation where the good is denied in fact, and then lives in imagination. The habit denied overt expression asserts itself in idea. It sets up the thought, the ideal of food. This thought is not what is sometimes called thought, a pale, bloodless abstraction, but is charged with the motor urgent force of habit. Food as a good is now subjective, personal, but it has its source in objective conditions and it moves forward to new objective conditions. For it works to secure a change of environment so that food will again be present in fact. Food is a subjective good during a temporary transitional stage from one object to another. The analogy with morals lies upon the surface. A habit impeded in overt operation continues nonetheless to operate. It manifests itself in desireful thought, that is, in an ideal or imagined object which embodies within itself the force of a frustrated habit. There is therefore demand for a changed environment, a demand which can be achieved only by some modification and rearrangement of old habits. Even Plato preserves an intimation of the natural function of ideal objects when he insists upon their value as patterns for use in reorganization of the actual scene. The pity is that he could not see that patterns exist only within and for the sake of reorganization, so that they, rather than empirical or natural objects, are the instrumental affairs. Not seeing this, he converted a function of reorganization into a metaphysical reality. If we essay a technical formulation, we shall say that morality becomes legitimately subjective or personal when activities which once included objective factors in their operation temporarily lose support from objects and yet strive to change existing conditions until they regain a support which has been lost. It is all of a kind with the doings of a man who, remembering a prior satisfaction of thirst in the conditions under which it occurred, digs a well. For the time being, water in reference to his activity exists in imagination, not in fact. But this imagination is not a self-generated, self-enclosed psychical existence. It is the persistent operation of a prior object which has been incorporated in effective habit. There is no miracle in the fact that an object in a new context operates in a new way. Of transcendental morals, it may at least be said that they retain the intimation of the objective character of purposes and goods.
purely subjective morals arise from the incidents of the temporary though recurrent crisis of reorganization are taken as complete and final in themselves a self having habits and attitudes formed with the cooperation of objects runs ahead of immediately surrounding objects to effect a new equilibration subjective morals substitutes a self always set over against objects and generating its ideals independently of objects and in permanent not transitory opposition to them achievement any achievement is to it a negligible second best a cheap and poor substitute for ideals that live only in the mind a compromise with actuality made from physical necessity not from moral reasons in truth there is but a temporal episode for a time self a person carries in his own habits against the forces of the immediate environment a good which the existing environment denies for this self moving temporarily in isolation from objective conditions between a good a completeness that has been and one that is hoped to restore in some new form subjective theories have substituted an erring soul wandering hopelessly between a paradise lost in the dim past and a paradise to be regained in the dim future in reality even when a person is in some respects at odds with his environment and so has to act for the time being as the sole agent of a good he in many respects is still supported by objective conditions and is in possession of undisturbed goods and virtues men do die from thirst at times but upon the whole in their search for water they are sustained by other fulfilled powers but subjective morals taken wholesale sets up a solitary self without objective ties and sustenance in fact there exists a shifting mixture of vice and virtue theories paint a world with a god in heaven and a devil in hell moralists in short have failed to recall that a severance of moral desire and purpose from immediate actualities is an inevitable phase of activity when habits persist while the world which they have incorporated alters back of this failure lies the failure to recognize that in a changing world old habits must perforce need modification no matter how good they have been obviously any such change can be only experimental the lost objective good persists in habit but it can recur in objective form only through some condition of affairs which has not been yet experienced and which therefore can be anticipated only uncertainly and inexactly the essential point is that anticipation should at least guide as well as stimulate effort that it should be a working hypothesis corrected and developed by events as action proceeds there was a time when men believed that each object in the external world carried its nature stamped upon it as a form and that intelligence consisted of simply inspecting and reading off an intrinsic self-enclosed complete nature the scientific revolution which began in the seventeenth century came through a surrender of this point of view it began with recognition that every natural object is in truth an event continuous in space and time with other events and is to be known only by experimental inquiries which will exhibit a multitude of complicated obscure and minute relationships any observed form or object is but a challenge the case is not otherwise with ideals of justice or peace or human brotherhood or equality or order they too are not things self-enclosed to be known by introspection as objects were once supposed to be known by rational insight like thunderbolts and tubercular disease and the rainbow they can be known only by extensive and minute observation of consequences incurred in action a false psychology of an isolated self and a subjective morality shuts out from morals the things important to it facts and habits and their objective consequences at the same time it misses the point characteristic of the personal subjective aspect of morality the significance of desire and thought in breaking down old rigidities of habit and preparing the way for acts that recreate an environment 
End of part one, section three, character and conduct. Human Nature and Conduct by John Dewey Part 1, Section 4, Custom and Habit Human Psychology is Social, Habit as Conservative, Mind and Body This LibriVox recording, read by William Jones, is in the public domain. We often fancy that institutions, social custom, and collective habit have been formed by the consolidation of individual habits. In the main, this supposition is false to fact. To a considerable extent, customs, or widespread uniformities of habit, exist because individuals face the same situation and react in like fashion. But to a larger extent, customs persist because individuals form their personal habits under conditions set by prior customs. An individual usually acquires the morality as he inherits the speech of his social group. The activities of the group are already there, and some assimilation of his own acts to their pattern is a prerequisite of a share therein, and hence of having any part in what is going on. Each person is born an infant, and every infant is subject from the first breath he draws and the first cry he utters to the attentions and demands of others. These others are not just persons in general with minds in general. They are beings with habits, and beings who upon the whole esteem the habits they have, if for no other reason than that having them their imagination is thereby limited. The nature of habit is to be assertive, insistent, and self-perpetuating. There is no miracle in the fact that if a child learns any language, he learns the language that those about him speak and teach, especially since his ability to speak that language is a precondition of his entering into effective connection with them, making wants known, and getting them satisfied. Fond parents and relatives frequently pick up a few of the child's spontaneous modes of speech, and for a time, at least, they are portions of the speech of that group. But the ratio which such words bear to the total vocabulary in use gives a fair measure of the part played by purely individual habit in forming custom in comparison with the part played by custom in forming individual habits. Few persons have either the energy or the wealth to build private roads to travel on. They find it convenient natural, to use the roads that are already there, while unless their private roads connect at some point with the highway, they cannot build them even if they would. These simple facts seem to me to give a simple explanation of matters that are often surrounded with mystery. To talk about the priority of society to the individual is to indulge in nonsensical metaphysics. But to say that some pre-existent association of human beings is prior to every particular human being who is born to the world is to mention a commonplace. These associations are definite modes of interaction of persons with one another. That is to say, they form customs or institutions. There is no problem in all history so artificial as that of how individuals manage to form society. The problem is due to the pleasure taken in manipulating concepts, and discussion goes on because concepts are kept from inconvenient contact with facts. The facts of infancy and sex have only to be called to mind to see how manufactured are the conceptions which enter into this particular problem. The problem, however, of how those established and more or less deeply grooved systems of interaction, which we call social groups, big and small, modify the activities of individuals who perforce are caught up within them, and how the activities of component individuals remake and redirect previously established custom is a deeply significant one. Viewed from the standpoint of custom and its priority to the formation of habits in human beings who are born babies and gradually grow to maturity, 
The facts which are now usually assembled under the conceptions of collective minds, group minds, national minds, crowd minds, etc., etc., lose the mysterious air they exhale when mind is thought of, as orthodox psychology teaches us to think of it, as something which precedes action. It is difficult to see that collective mind means anything more than a custom brought at some point to explicit emphatic consciousness, emotional or intellectual. Footnote number three. Mob psychology comes under the same principles, but in a negative aspect. The crowd and mob express a disintegration of habits which releases impulse and renders persons susceptible to immediate stimuli rather than such a functioning of habits as is found in the mind of a club or school of thought or political party. Leaders of an organization, that is, of an interaction having settled habits, may, however, in order to put over some scheme, deliberately resort to stimuli which will break through the crust of ordinary custom and release impulses on such a scale as to create a mob psychology. Since fear is a normal reaction to the unfamiliar, dread and suspicion are the forces most played upon to accomplish this result, together with vast, vague, contrary hopes. This is an ordinary technique in excited political campaigns, in starting war, etc., but an assimilation like that of Le Bon of the psychology of democracy to the psychology of a crowd in overriding individual judgment shows a lack of psychological insight. A political democracy exhibits an overriding of thought like that seen in any convention or institution. That is, thought is submerged in habit. In the crowd and mob, it is submerged in undefined emotion. China and Japan exhibit crowd psychology more frequently than do Western democratic countries. Not in my judgment because of any essentially oriental psychology, but because of a nearer background of rigid and solid customs conjoined with the phenomena of a period of transition. The introduction of many novel stimuli creates occasions where habits afford no ballast. Hence, great waves of emotion easily sweep through masses. Sometimes they are waves of enthusiasm for the new, sometimes a violent reaction against it, both equally undiscriminating. The war has left behind it a somewhat similar situation in Western countries. End of footnote 3. The family into which one is born is a family in a village or city, which interacts with other more or less integrated systems of activity, and which includes a diversity of groupings within itself, say, churches, political parties, clubs, cliques, partnerships, trade unions, corporations, etc. If we start with the traditional notion of mind as something complete in itself, then we may well be perplexed by the problem of how a common mind, common ways of feeling and believing and purposing, comes into existence and then forms these groups. The case is quite otherwise if we recognize that in any case we must start with group action, that is, with some fairly settled system of interaction among individuals. The problem of origin and development of the various groupings or definite customs in existence at any particular time in any particular place is not solved by reference to psychic causes, elements, or forces. It is to be solved by reference to facts of action. Demand for food, for houses, for a mate, for someone to talk to and to listen to one talk, for control of others. Demands which are all intensified by the fact already mentioned that each person begins a helpless, dependent creature. I do not mean, of course, that hunger, fear, sexual love, gregariousness, sympathy, parental love, love of bossing and being ordered about, imitation, etc., play no part. But I do mean that these words do not express elements or forces which are psychic or mental in their first intention. They denote ways of behavior. These ways of behaving involve interaction, that is to say, and prior groupings. 
and to understand the existence of organized ways or habits, we surely need to go to physics, chemistry, and physiology, rather than to psychology. There is doubtless a great mystery as to why any such thing as being conscious should exist at all. But if consciousness exists at all, there is no mystery in its being connected with what it is connected with. That is to say, if an activity which is an interaction of various factors or a grouped activity comes to consciousness, it seems natural that it should take the form of an emotion, a belief or purpose that reflects the interaction, that it should be an our consciousness or a my consciousness. And by this is meant both that it will be shared by those who are implicated in the associative custom, or more or less alike in them all, and that it will be felt or thought to concern others as well as oneself. A family custom, or organized habit of action, comes into contact and conflict, for example, with that of some other family. The emotions of ruffled pride, the belief about superiority or being as good as other people, the intention to hold one's own, are naturally our feeling, an idea of our treatment and position. Substitute the Republican Party or the American nation for the family, and the general situation remains the same. The conditions which determine the nature and extent of the particular grouping in question are matters of supreme import. But they are not, as such, subject matter of psychology, but of the history of politics, law, religion, economics, invention, the technology of communications and intercourse. Psychology comes in as an indispensable tool, but it enters into the matter of understanding these various special topics, not into the question of what psychic forces form a collective mind and therefore a social group. That way of stating the case puts the cart a long way before the horse and naturally gathers obscurities and, and mysteries to itself. In short, the primary facts of social psychology center about collective habit, custom. In addition to the general psychology of habit, which is general and not individual in any intelligible sense of the word, we need to find out just how different customs shape the desires, beliefs, and purposes of those who are affected by them. The problem of social psychology is not how either individual or collective mind forms social groups and custom, but how different customs established interacting arrangements form and nurture different minds. From this general statement, we return to our special problem, which is how the rigid character of past custom has unfavorably influenced beliefs, emotions, and purposes having to do with morals. We come back to the fact that individuals begin their career as infants, for the plasticity of the young presents a temptation to those having greater experience and hence greater power which they rarely resist. It seems putty to be molded according to current designs. That plasticity also means that power to change prevailing custom is ignored. Docility is looked upon not as ability to learn whatever the world has to teach, but as subjection to those instructions of others which reflect their current habits. To be truly docile is to be eager to learn all the lessons of active inquiring and expanding experience. The inert, stupid quality of current customs perverts learning into a willingness to follow where others point the way, into conformity, constriction, surrender of skepticism, and experiment. When we think of the docility of the young, we first think of the stocks of information adults wish to impose and the way of acting they want to reproduce. Then we think of the insolent coercions, the insinuating briberies, the pedagogic solemnities by which the freshness of youth can be faded and its vivid curiosities dulled. Education becomes the art of taking advantage of the helplessness of the young. The forming of habits becomes a guarantee for the maintenance of hedges of custom. Of course, it is not wholly forgotten that habits are abilities and arts. Any striking exhibition of acquired skill 
in physical matters like that of an acrobat or billiard player arouses universal admiration but we like to have innovating power limited to technical matters and reserve our admiration for those manifestations that display virtuosity rather than virtue in moral matters it is assumed that it is enough if some ideal has been exemplified in the life of a leader so that it is now the part of others to follow and reproduce for every branch of conduct there is a jesus or buddha a napoleon or marx a Froebel or tolstoy whose pattern of action exceeding our own grasp is reduced to a practicable copy size by passage through rows and rows of lesser leaders the notion that it suffices if the idea the end is present in the mind of some authority dominates formal schooling it permeates the unconscious education derived from ordinary contact and intercourse where following is taken to be normal moral originality is pretty sure to be eccentric but if independence were the rule originality would be subjected to severe experimental tests and be saved from cranky eccentricity as it is now in say higher mathematics the regime of custom assumes that the outcome is the same whether an individual understands what he is about or whether he goes through certain motions while mouthing the words of others repetition of formulae being esteemed of greater importance upon the whole than repetition of deeds to say what the sect or clique or class says is the way of proving that one also understands and approves what the clique clings to in theory democracy should be a means of stimulating original thought and of evoking action deliberately adjusted in advance to cope with new forces in fact it is still so immature that its main effect is to multiply occasions for imitation if progress in spite of this fact is more rapid than in other social forms it is by accident since the diversity of models conflict with one another and thus give individuality a chance in the resulting chaos of opinions current democracy acclaims success more boisterously than do other social forms and surrounds failure with a more reverberating train of echoes but the prestige thus given excellence is largely adventitious the achievement of thought attracts others not so much intrinsically as because of an eminence due to multitudinous advertising and a swarm of imitators even liberal thinkers have treated habit as essentially not because of the character of existing customs conservative in fact only in a society dominated by modes of belief and admiration fixed by past custom is habit any more conservative than it is progressive it all depends upon its quality habit is an ability an art formed through past experience but whether an ability is limited to repetition of past acts adopted to past conditions or is available for new emergencies depends wholly upon what kind of habit exists the tendency to think that only bad habits are disserviceable and that bad habits are conventionally innumerable conduces to make all habits more or less bad for what makes a habit bad is enslavement to old ruts the common notion that enslavement to good ends converts mechanical routine into good is a negation of the principle of moral goodness it identifies morality with what was sometime rational possibly in some prior experience of one's own but more probably in the experience of someone else who is now blindly set up as a final authority the genuine heart of reasonableness and of goodness in conduct lies in the effective mastery of the conditions which now enter into action to be satisfied with repeating with traversing the ruts which in other conditions led to good is the surest way of creating carelessness about present and actual good consider what happens to thought when habit is merely power to repeat acts without thought where does thought exist and operate when it is excluded from habitual activities 
Is not such thought of necessity shut out from effective power, from ability to control objects and command events? Habits deprived of thought and thought which is futile are two sides of the same fact. To laud habit as conservative while praising thought as the mainspring of progress is to take the surest course to making thought abstruse and irrelevant and progress a matter of accident and catastrophe. The concrete fact behind the current separation of body and mind, practice and theory, actuality and ideals, is precisely the separation of habit and thought. Thought, which does not exist within ordinary habits of action, lacks means of execution. In lacking application, it also lacks test and criterion. Hence, it is condemned to a separate realm. If we try to act upon it, our actions are clumsy and forced. In fact, contrary habits, as we have already seen, come into operation and betray our purpose. After a few such experiences, it is subconsciously decided that thought is too precious and high to be exposed to the contingencies of action. It is reserved for separate uses. Thought feeds only thought, not action. Ideals must not run the risk of contamination and perversion by contact with actual conditions. Thought then either resorts to specialized and technical matters influencing action in the library or laboratory alone, or else it becomes sentimentalized. Meantime, there are certain practical men who combine thought and habit and who are effectual. Their thought is about their own advantage and their habits correspond. They dominate the actual situation. They encourage routine in others, and they also subsidize such thought and learning as are kept remote from affairs. This they call sustaining the standard of the ideal. Subjection they praise as team spirit, loyalty, devotion, obedience, industry, and law and order. But they temper respect for law, by which they mean the order of the existing status, on the part of others with most skillful and thoughtful manipulation of it on behalf of their own ends, while they denounce as subversive anarchy signs of independent thought or of thinking for themselves on the part of others, lest such thought disturb the conditions by which they profit, they think quite literally for themselves, that is, of themselves. This is the eternal game of the practical man. Hence, it is only by accident that the separate and endowed thought of professional thinkers leaks out into action and affects custom. For thinking cannot itself escape the influence of habit any more than anything else human. If it is not part of ordinary habits, then it is a separate habit, habit alongside other habits, apart from them, as isolated and indurated as human structure permits. Theory is a possession of the theorist, intellect of the intellectualist. The so-called separation of theory and practice means in fact the separation of two kinds of practice, one taking place in the outdoor world, the other in the study. The habit of thought commands some materials, as every habit must do, but the materials are technical, books and words. Ideas are objectified in action, but speech and writing monopolize their field of action. Even then, subconscious pains are taken to see that the words used are not too widely understood. Intellectual habits, like other habits, demand an environment, but the environment is the study, library, laboratory, academy. Like other habits, they produce external results, possessions. Some men acquire ideas and knowledge, as other men acquire monetary wealth. While practicing thought for their own special ends, they deprecate it for the untrained and unstable masses for whom habits, that is, unthinking routines, are necessities. They favor popular education up to the point of disseminating, as a matter of authoritative information for the many, what the few have established by thought, and up to the point of converting an original docility to the new into a docility to repeat and to conform. Yet all habit involves mechanization, 
Habit is impossible without setting up a mechanism of action, physiologically ingrained, which operates spontaneously, automatically whenever the cue is given. But mechanization is not of necessity all there is to habit. Consider the conditions under which the first serviceable abilities of life are formed. When a child begins to walk, he acutely observes, he intently and intensely experiments. He looks to see what is going to happen, and he keeps curious watch on every incident. What others do, the assistance they give, and the models they set, operate not as limitations but as encouragements to his own acts, reinforcements of personal perception and endeavor. The first toddling is a romantic adventure into the unknown, and every gained power is a delightful discovery of one's own powers and of the wonders of the world. We may not be able to retain in adult habits this zest of intelligence and this freshness of satisfaction in newly discovered powers, but there is surely a middle term between a normal exercise of power, which includes some excursion into the unknown, and a mechanical activity hedged within a drab world. Even in dealing with inanimate machines, we rank that invention higher which adapts its movements to varying conditions. All life operates through a mechanism, and the higher the form of life, the more complex, sure, and flexible the mechanism. This fact alone should save us from opposing life and mechanism, thereby reducing the latter to unintelligent automatism, and the former to an aimless splurge. How delicate, prompt, sure, and varied are the movements of a violin player or an engraver. How unerringly they phrase every shade of emotion and every turn of idea. Mechanism is indispensable. If each act has to be consciously searched for at the moment and intentionally performed, execution is painful and the product is clumsy and halting. Nevertheless, the difference between the artist and the mere technician is unmistakable. The artist is a masterful technician. The technique or mechanism is fused with thought and feeling. The mechanical performer permits the mechanism to dictate the performance. It is absurd to say that the latter exhibits habit and the former not. We are confronted with two kinds of habit, intelligent and routine. All life has its elan, but only the prevalence of dead habits deflects life into mere elan. Yet the current dualism of mind and body, thought and action, is so rooted that we are taught, and science is said to support the teaching, that the art, the habit, of the artist is acquired by previous mechanical exercises of repetition in which skill, apart from thought, is the aim, until suddenly, magically, this soulless mechanism is taken possession of by sentiment and imagination and becomes a flexible instrument of mind. The fact, the scientific fact, is that even in his exercises, his practice for skill, an artist uses an art he already has. He acquires greater skill because of the practice of skill is more important to him than the practice for skill. Otherwise, natural endowment would count for nothing, and sufficient mechanical exercise would make anyone an expert in any field. A flexible, sensitive habit grows more varied and more adaptable by practice and use. We do not as yet fully understand the physiology factors concerned in mechanical routine on one hand and artistic skill on the other, but we do know that the latter is just as much habit as is the former. Whether it concerns the cook, musician, carpenter, citizen, or statesman, the intelligent or artistic habit is the desirable thing, and the routine the undesirable thing, or at least desirable and undesirable from every point of view except one. Those who wish a monopoly of social power find desirable a separation of habit and thought, action and soul, so characteristic of history. For the dualism enables them to do the thinking and planning, while others remain the docile, even if awkward, instruments of execution. Until this scheme is changed, 
democracy is bound to be perverted in realization. With our present system of education, by which something much more extensive than schooling is meant, democracy multiplies occasions for imitation, not occasions for thought in action. If the visible result is rather a messy confusion than an ordered discipline of habits, it is because there are so many models of imitation set up that they tend to cancel one another, so that individuals have the advantage neither of uniform training nor of intelligent adaptation. Once an intellectualist, the one with whom thinking is in self a segregated habit, infers that the choice is between muss and muddling and a bureaucracy. He prefers the latter, though under some other name, usually an aristocracy of talent and intellect, possibly a dictatorship of the proletariat. It has been repeatedly stated that the current philosophical dualism of mind and body, of spirit and mere outward doing, is ultimately but an intellectual reflex of the social divorce of routine habit from thought, of means from ends and practice from theory. One hardly knows whether most to admire the acumen with which Bergson has penetrated through the accumulation of historic technicalities to this essential fact, or to deplore the artistic skill with which he has recommended the division and the metaphysical subtlety with which he has striven to establish its necessary and unchangeable nature. For the latter tends to confirm and sanction the dualism in all its obnoxiousness. In the end, however, detection and discovery is the main thing. To envisage the relation of spirit, life, to matter, body, as in effect an affair of a force which outruns habit while it leaves a trail of routine habits behind it, will surely turn out in the end to imply the acknowledgement of the need of a continuous unification of spirit and habit rather than to be a sanction of their divorce. And when Bergson carries the implicit logic to the point of a clear recognition that upon this basis concrete intelligence is concerned with the habits which incorporate and deal with objects and that nothing remains to spirit and pure thought except the blind onward push or impetus, the net conclusion is surely the need of revision of the fundamental premise of separation of soul and habit. A blind creative force is as likely to turn out to be destructive as creative. The vital elan may delight in war rather than in the laborious arts of civilization, and a mystic intuition of an ongoing splurge be a poor substitute for the detailed work of an intelligence embodied in custom and institution one which creates by means of flexible, continuous contrivances of reorganization. For the eulogistic qualities which Bergson attributes to the Elan Vitel flow not from its nature, but from a reminiscence of the optimism of Romanticism, an optimism which is only the reverse side of pessimism about actualities. A spiritual life, which is nothing but a blind urge separated from thought, which is said to be confined to mechanical manipulation of material objects for personal uses, is likely to have the attributes of the devil in spite of its being ennobled with the name of God. End of Part 1, Section 4, Custom and Habit Human Nature and Conduct by John Dewey Part 1, Section 5, Custom and Morality Customs as Standards, Authority of Standards, Class Conflicts. This LibriVox recording, read by William Jones, is in the public domain. For practical purposes, morals means customs, folkways, and established collective habits. This is a commonplace of the anthropologist, though the moral theorist generally suffers from an illusion that his own place and day is, or ought to be, an exception. But always and everywhere, customs supply the standards for personal activities. They are the pattern into which individual activity must weave itself. This is as true today as it ever was. 
but because of present mobility and interminglings of customs an individual is now offered an enormous range of custom patterns and can exercise personal ingenuity in selecting and rearranging their elements in short he can if he will intelligently adapt customs to conditions and thereby remake them customs in any case constitute moral standards for they are active demands for certain ways of acting every habit creates an unconscious expectation it forms a certain outlook what psychologists have laboriously treated under the caption of association of ideas has little to do with ideas and everything to do with the influence of habit upon recollection and perception a habit a routine habit when interfered with generates an easiness sets up a protest in favor of restoration a sense of need of some expiatory act or else it goes off in casual reminiscence it is the essence of routine to insist upon its own continuation breach of it is a violation of right deviation from it is transgression all that metaphysics has said about the nisus of being to conserve its essence and all that a mythological psychology has said about a special instinct of self-preservation is a cover for the persistent self-assertion of habit habit is energy organized in certain channels when interfered with it swells as resentment and as an avenging force to say that it will be obeyed that custom makes law that no most is lord of all is after all only to say that habit is habit emotion is a perturbation from clash or failure of habit and reflection roughly speaking is the painful effort of disturbed habits to readjust themselves it is a pity that westermark in his monumental collection of facts which show the connection of custom and morals is still so much under the influence of current subjective psychology that he misstates the point of his data for although he recognizes the objectivity of custom he treats sympathetic resentment and approbation as distinctive interfeelings or conscious states which give rise to acts in his anxiety to displace an unreal rational source of morals he sets up an equally unreal emotional basis in truth feelings as well as reason spring up within action breach of custom or habit is the source of sympathetic resentment while overt approbation goes out to fidelity to custom maintained under exceptional circumstances those who recognize the place of custom in lower social forms generally regard its presence in civilized society as a mere survival or like sumner they fancy that to recognize its abiding place is equivalent to the denial of all rationality and principle to morality equivalent to the assertion of blind arbitrary forces in life in effect this point of view has already been dealt with it overlooks the fact that the real opposition is not between reason and habit but between routine unintelligent habit and intelligent habit or art even a savage custom may be reasonable in that it is adapted to social needs and uses experience may add to such adaptation a conscious recognition of it and then the custom of rationality is added to a prior custom external reasonableness or adaptation to ends precedes reasonableness of mind this is only to say that in morals as well as in physics things have to be there before we perceive them and that rationality of mind is not an original endowment but is the offspring of intercourse with objective adaptations and relations a view which under the influence of a conception of knowing the like by the like has been distorted into platonic and other objective idealisms reason as observation of an adaptation of acts to valuable results is not however a mere idle mirroring of pre-existent facts it is an additional event having its own career it sets up a heightened emotional appreciation and provides a new motive for fidelities previously blind 
it sets up an attitude of criticism, of inquiry, and makes men sensitive to the brutalities and extravagancies of customs. In short, it becomes a custom of expectation and outlook, an active demand for reasonableness in other customs. The reflective disposition is not self-made nor a gift from the gods. It arises in some exceptional circumstances out of social customs, as we see in the case of the Greeks. But when it has been generated, it establishes a new custom, which is capable of exercising the most revolutionary influence upon other customs. Hence the growing importance of personal rationality or intelligence in moral theory if not in practice. That current customs contradict one another, that many of them are unjust, and that without criticism none of them is fit to be the guide of life was the discovery with which the Athenian Socrates initiated conscious moral theorizing. Yet a dilemma soon presented itself, one which forms the burden of Plato's ethical writings. How shall thought, which is personal, arrive at standards which hold good for all, which in modern phrase are objective? The solution found by Plato was that reason is itself objective, universal, and cosmic, and makes the individual soul its vehicle. The result, however, was merely to substitute a metaphysical or transcendental ethics for the ethics of custom. If Plato had been able to see that reflection and criticism express a conflict of customs, and that their purport and office is to reorganize and readjust customs, the subsequent course of moral theory would have been very different. Custom would have provided needed objective and substantial balance, and personal rationality or reflective intelligence would have been treated as the necessary organ of experimental initiative and creative invention in remaking custom. We have another difficulty to face. The greater wave rises to overwhelm us. It is said that to derive moral standards from social customs is to evacuate the latter of all authority. Morals, it is said, imply the subordination of fact to ideal consideration. While the view presented makes morals secondary to bare fact, which is equal to depriving them of dignity and jurisdiction. The objection has the force of the custom of moral theorists behind it, and therefore in its denial of custom avails itself of the assistance of the notion it attacks. The criticism rests upon a false separation. It argues, in effect, that either ideal standards antecede customs and confer their moral quality upon them, or that in being subsequent to custom and evolved from them, they are mere accidental byproducts. But how does the case stand with language? Men did not intend language. They did not have social objects consciously in view when they began to talk, nor did they have grammatical and phonetic principles before them by which to regulate their efforts at communication. These things come after the fact, and because of it. Language grew out of unintelligent babblings, instinctive motions called gestures, and the pressure of circumstance. But nevertheless, language once called into existence is language and operates as language. It operates not to perpetuate the forces which produced it, but to modify and redirect them. It has such transcendent importance that pains are taken with its use. Literatures are produced, and then a vast apparatus of grammar, rhetoric, dictionaries, literary criticism, reviews, essays, and derived literature, education, and schooling become a necessity, literacy, and end. In short, language, when it is produced, meets old needs and opens new possibilities. It creates demands which take effect and the effect is not confined to speech and literature, but extends to the common life in communication, counsel, and instruction. What is said of the institution of language holds true of every institution. Family life, property, legal forms, churches and schools, academies of art and science did not originate to serve conscious ends, nor was their generation regulated by consciousness of principles of reason and right. Yet. Each institution has brought with its development demands, expectation, rules, and standards. 
These are not mere embellishments of the forces which produce them, nor idle decorations of the scene. They are additional forces. They reconstruct. They open new avenues of endeavor and impose new labors. In short, they are civilization, culture, and morality. Still, the question recurs. What authority have standards and ideas which have originated in this way? What claim have they upon us? In one sense, the question is unanswerable. In the same sense, however, the question is unanswerable. Whatever the origin and sanction is ascribed to moral obligations and loyalties. Why attend to metaphysical and transcendental ideal realities, even if we concede they are the authors of moral standards? Why do this act if I feel like doing something else? Any moral question may reduce itself to this question, if we so choose. But in an empirical sense, the answer is simple. The authority is that of life. Why employ language, cultivate literature, acquire and develop science, sustain industry, and submit to the refinements of art? To ask these questions is equivalent to asking, why live? And the only answer is that if one is going to live, one must live a life of which these things form the substance. The only question having sense which can be asked is, how are we going to use and be used by these things? not whether we are going to use them. Reason and moral principles cannot in any case be shoved behind these affairs, for reason and morality grow out of them. But they have grown into them as well as out of them. They are there as part of them. No one can escape them if he wants to. He cannot escape the problem of how to engage in life, since in any case he must engage in it some way or another or else quit and get out. In short, the choice is not between a moral authority outside custom and one within it. It is between adopting more or less intelligent and significant customs. Curiously enough, the chief practical effect of refusing to recognize the connection of custom with moral standards is to deify some special custom and treat it as eternal, immutable, outside of criticism and revision. This consequence is especially harmful in times of rapid social flux, for it leads to disparity between nominal standards, which become ineffectual and hypocritical in exact ratio to their theoretical exaltation, and actual habits, which have to take note of existing conditions. The disparity breeds disorder. Irregularity and confusion are, however, practically intolerable, an effective generation of a new rule of some sort or another. Only such complete disturbance of the physical basis of life and security, as comes from plague and starvation, can throw society into utter disorder. No amount of intellectual transition can seriously disturb the main tenor of custom or morals. Hence, the greater danger which attends to the attempt in a period of social change to maintain the immutability of old standards is not general moral relaxation it is rather social clash an irreconciled conflict of moral standards and purposes the most serious form of class warfare for segregated classes develop their own customs which is to say their own working morals as long as society is mainly immobile these diverse principles and ruling aims do not clash they exist side by side in different strata. Power, glory, honor, magnificent, mutual faith, here, industry, obedience, abstinence, humility, and reverence, there, noble and plebeian virtues. Vigor, courage, energy, enterprise, here, submission, patience, charm, personal fidelity, there, the masculine and feminine virtues. But mobility invades society. War, commerce, travel, and communication, contact with the thoughts and desires of other classes, and new inventions in productive industry disturbed the settled distribution of customs. Congealed habits thaw out, and a flood mixes things once separated. Each class is rigidly sure of the rightness of its own ends, and hence not over-scrupulous about the means of attaining them. One side 
proclaims the ultimacy of order, that of some old order which conduces to its own interest. The other side proclaims its rights to freedom and identifies justice with its submerged claims. There is no common ground, no moral understanding, no agreed upon standard of appeal. Today such a conflict occurs between propertied classes and those who depend upon daily wage, between men and women, between old and young. Each appeals to its own standard of right, and each thinks the other to be the creature of personal desire, whim, or obstinacy. Mobility has affected peoples as well. Nations and races face one another, each with its own immutable standards. Never before in history have there existed such numerous contacts and minglings. Never before have there been such occasions for conflict, which are the more significant because each side feels that it is supported by moral principles, customs relating to what has been, and emotions referring to what may come to be, go their independent ways. The demand of each side treats its opponent as a willful violator of moral principles, an expression of self-interest or superior might, intelligence, which is the only possible messenger of reconciliation, dwells in a far land of abstractions, where comes after the event to record accomplished facts. End of Part 1, Section 5, Custom and Morality Human Nature and Conduct by John Dewey Part 1, Section 6, Habit and Social Psychology Isolation of Individuality and Newer Movements This LibriVox recording, read by William Jones, is in the public domain. The prior discussion has tried to show why the psychology of habit is an objective and social psychology. Settled and regular action must contain an adjustment of environing conditions. It must incorporate them in itself. For human beings, the environing affairs which are directly important are those formed by the activities of other human beings. This fact is accentuated and made fundamental by the fact of infancy. The fact that each human being begins a life completely dependent upon others. The net outcome, accordingly, is that what can be called distinctively individual in behavior and mind is not, contrary to traditional theory, an original datum. Doubtless, physical or physiological individuality always colors responsive activity and hence modifies the form which custom assumes in its personal reproductions. In forceful, energetic characters, this quality is marked. But it is important to note that it is a quality of habit, not an element or force existing apart from the adjustment of the environment and capable of being termed a separate individual mind. Orthodox psychology starts, however, from the assumption of precisely such independent minds. However much different schools may vary in their definitions of mind, they agree in this premise of separateness and priority. Hence, social psychology is confused by the effort to render its facts in the terms characteristics of old psychology, when the distinctive thing about it is that it implies an abandonment of that psychology. The traditional psychology of the original separate soul, mind, or consciousness is in truth a reflex of conditions which cut human nature off from its natural objective relations. It implies first the severance of man from nature, and then of each man from his fellows. The isolation of man from nature is duly manifested in the split between mind and body, since body is clearly a connected part of nature. Thus the instrument of action and the means of continuous modifications of actions, of the cumulative carrying forward of old activity into new, is regarded as a mysterious intruder or as a mysterious parallel accompaniment. It is fair to say that the psychology of a separate and independent consciousness began as an intellectual formulation of those facts of morality which treated the most important kind of action as a private concern, 
something to be enacted and concluded within character as a purely personal possession. The religious and metaphysical interests which wanted the ideal to be a separate realm finally coincided with a practical revolt against current customs and institutions to enforce current psychological individualism. But this formulation, put forth in the name of science, reacted to confirm the conditions out of which it rose and to convert it from a historic episode into an essential truth. Its exaggeration of individuality is largely a compensatory reaction against the pressure of institutional rigidities. Any moral theory which is seriously influenced by current psychological theory is bound to emphasize states of consciousness and inner private life at the expense of acts which have public meaning and which incorporate and exact social relationships. A psychology based upon habits and instincts, which become elements in habits as soon as they are acted upon, will on the contrary fix its attention upon the objective conditions in which habits are formed and operate. The rise at the present time of a clinical psychology, which revolts at traditional and orthodox psychology, is a symptom of ethical import. It is a protest against the futility, as a tool of understanding and dealing with human nature in the concrete, of the psychology of conscious sensations, images, and idea. It exhibits a sense for reality in its insistence upon the profound importance of unconscious forces in determining not only overt conduct, but desire, judgment, belief, and idealization. Every moment of reaction and protest, however, usually accepts some of the basic ideas of the position against which it rebels. So the most popular forms of the clinical psychology those associated with the founders of psychoanalysis, retain the notion of a separate psychic realm or force. They add a statement pointing to facts of the utmost value, and which is equivalent to practical recognition of the dependence of mind upon habit and of habit upon social conditions. This is the statement of the existence and operation of the unconscious, of complexes due to contacts and conflicts with others, of the social censor, but they still cling to the idea of the separate psychic realm and so in effect talk about unconscious consciousness. They get their truths mixed up in theory with the false psychology of original individual consciousness, just as the school of social psychologists does upon its side. Their elaborate artificial explanations, like the mystic collective mind, consciousness and oversoul of social psychology are due to failure to begin with the facts of habit and custom. What then is meant by individual mind? By mind as individual. In effect, the reply has already been given. Conflict of habits releases impulsive activities which in their manifestation require a modification of habit, of custom and convention. That which was at first the individualized color or quality of habitual activity is abstracted and becomes a center of activity aiming to reconstruct custom in accord with some desire which is rejected by the immediate situation and which therefore is felt to belong to one's self, to be the mark and possession of an individual in partial and temporary opposition to his environment. These general and necessarily vague statements will be made more definite in the further discussion of impulse and intelligence. For impulse, when it asserts itself deliberately against an existing custom, is the beginning of individuality in mind. This beginning is developed and consolidated in the observation, judgments, and inventions which try to transform the environment so that a variant deviating impulse may itself in turn become incarnated in objective habit. End of part one, section six, habit and social psychology.